What is going on? Welcome back. Episode 55 of the 3rd and 20 podcast. My name is Frank Anthos, so we got the main man himself, Mr. Steed. Steed, what's going on? How you doing, dude? Doing pretty good, man. Chilling. Ready to talk about today's uh, segments. Yeah, you guys got a big Hawks game tonight. Hawks, what is it, game five here? All tight, series game tied five. up? Series tied up. Giannis is not playing tonight. Don't know about Trey. But Giannis? I mean, Giannis, that's what I call him. Uh, but, yeah, looking nice for the Hawks, dude. We might actually go to the finals. Who knows? All right. But enough basketball. Let's get into the football. And we've got one last division in our over-under segment. Um, we have the NFC North. We purposely put this one last because the Packers, we don't know what's going to happen with them. We're going to get into them last and have our own little segment on the Packers. But with that being said, let's go from the bottom to the top this time. We're going to go with the, the kneecap-eating, kneecap-biting Detroit Lions with Dan Campbell. Um, their over-under is placed at a hefty five games, five wins. Mm. Their under hit last year. Steve, you actually took the over last year on seven wins with the Lions, which shocked the world. Um, I see... The Lions have this funny thing, this funny way of every single year you wanting to somehow take the over on this football team. Yeah, well, especially when they had Stafford. Stafford yeah. gives you a chance to win, regardless of who he's playing for, you know? But even now, for some reason, because, you know, oh, 17 games, it's only five wins, the division may be without Aaron Rodgers, like – Somehow you still have that little voice in the back of your head saying, hit the over, hit the over. Yeah, well, the thing is, it's like if you put them, a lot of people put them into the category of those like really horrible teams we know coming in, like a Texans team or like a maybe a team like the Jets, like put them in that category where like I could easily hit the under of those teams and I'm not even worried about it. But for some reason, you know, I, I don't know if, if it's just their new coach and him talking about taking out kneecaps and all that. But I still kind of want to want to lean over for some reason with this team. Yeah, I think I like the head coaching signing. I thought that they were one of the clear winners from the draft. Their roster really on paper isn't as bad as people would, would make it out to be. To be completely honest, like we're gonna get into the offensive line rankings later, but this is a team that probably has a top half of the league offensive line. Yeah, easily. Their defensive line really is not terrible, and they added Alan McNeil and Levy Onwuzuriki. I really hope I didn't mm -hmm. butcher that. No, I think um, you got it right. I thought that Ifiatu Milifonwu, the Syracuse corner, their third round pick is a pretty damn good player, honestly. I thought he was a guy that was underrated, could get some second-round buzz coming into the draft. He goes in the third, no surprise. I think he could be a nice little addition on the secondary. Easily. But all in all, I think that this team is just not there. Um, I'm going to have to hit the under. I think that this could definitely be a push at five games. But I I, I don't believe it. I really don't. I, there's that receiving core. Even though I'm not really a big taking into account receiving cores in this in this stuff i don't like it the roster is really young i like the direction this team is headed i think that that dan campbell is the guy that can turn the the lions around you know, he was on that owen 16 team i think he understands where this team needs to come from but I, i'm gonna have to see it to believe it with the lions i've been bitten in the ass by this team one too many times to take the over yeah, man, this is really tough for me because the problem I have with it is not that they're a young team because they do have talent that I think, you know, through the duration of the season, you know, it will show and that the talent is good and then sometimes they'll have really bad games. My problem with it is we really get to see how good Jared Goff is without Sean McVay, and that's my problem with it. If I'm trusting this team to win more than five games – is Jared Goff going to play like that first round pick with like you know not as many weapons as he had in in uh, L. A. and alongside not having Sean McVay, who you know especially last year made Jared Goff look the way he was sometimes, you know, and I think he should get a big credit of that. So that being said, you're hitting the under. I know you're hitting the under. 
God, yeah, I have to hit the under. Yeah, I just don't trust it. I, I don't trust them. The, so there are two last things that I like about the under. I'm sorry, Lions fans. The first is that speaking of L.A., they have the former L.A. Chargers head coach as their offensive coordinator, Anthony Lynn, someone mm. who, when I watch Chargers games, I think has the most innate ability to run the ball at the worst times in football games. It is Crazy you're running back. mesmerizing to see how poor the Chargers were in end-of-game scenarios last year with the amount of talent that they had on both sides of the ball. I don't think offensively – I think this offense could put up numbers. I, I think that it could be statistically a good offense. But in terms of, oh, you know, it's a close football game. We're down five points. We need a touchdown. I'm not betting on this team to score at all. Mm-hmm. And I think that they're going to come up short much more than they convert, kind of like we saw with the Chargers to a certain extent under mm-hmm. Anthony Lynn's tenure, especially in the second half. Um, the last thing I had one more thing I wanted to say. I can't remember what it was. Um, I just think this team is going to be very gritty. You know, I think, I'm like, hoping. I, oh, I well, remember it. Um, real quick, the other thing I like about this under is that if you look at last year, every single team that had a really low over under win total hit the under, except for the Washington football team. And Mm. comparing defenses, this defense is nowhere near the Washington football team. Yeah, just not even close. So I think that their offense is average at best. Like in and that's like at the ceiling almost. Um, unless Jared Goff is going freaking crazy or DeAndre Swift is, you know, busted out on a Barry Sanders. Um I don't think this defense is, is going to be able to carry this team like we saw with the Washington football team last year, so I'm hitting the under. Let's move on to the Chicago Bears. Last year, oh. their over-under was eight wins. They pushed. We both hit the under on them. Their over-under win total is down half a game from last year to seven and a half wins. I'm going to go first. I'm hitting the under. I, I think oh, wow. This- okay. Yeah, well, I look at this football team. I think that they have some shining pieces. I thought that their draft, their past couple drafts, actually, I think he's have gotten a lot more, a lot more crap than they really deserve. They've added some nice talent, but I think once again we're going to see the Bears not have the quarterback spot figured out. I, I really don't believe in Andy Dalton, and Justin Fields as a rookie, I don't think is going to go out there and start winning games. Um, yeah. I think maybe he could be dynamic, but that's just what we've seen from rookie quarterbacks. Rookie quarterbacks, generally speaking, don't have winning records their first season. Well, rookie quarterbacks' first season, kind of redundant there. Um, I just look at the Bears, and I think it's a team that's gotten worse. You know, from I, one year to the next. On the de- especially on the defensive side of the ball, I think they've dropped dramatically, like, not drastically, but they have fallen under where they were – what was it, two years ago, three years ago? Even from last year, I don't think the defense is going to be as good. Maybe that's yeah, just me being kind of a bear tater. But, yeah, you get rid of Fuller, and you replace him with Desmond Trufant now. And now you're <laughs> – I like Jalen Johnson a lot, but now you're relying on him to be a number one corner in his second season in the NFL. Like, I don't think that this Bears team is really all that bad. I think they have some good pieces. Like, they still have Roquan Smith, Akeem Hicks, Khalil Mack. Like, this is a good team. But you're, you're kind of betting on them to be a playoff team again. And whether you want to admit it or not, David Montgomery and um, Mitchell Trubisky were hot at the end of last year. They were good. Yeah. Mitchell Trubisky, like, people don't want to admit it. But if you look at the numbers from, like, what, week 10 to probably week 16, right before you that last Packers game, he's a top five quarterback. He was. It's weird yeah, to say, really but, like, good. you can't deny the fact that they were putting up, like, 35 a game. I mean, we talked about that, too. Like, his, like, little second stint after they, you know, took out Nick Foles and he came back in. He kind of took it and ran with it. Yeah, it was like once the pressure was off his shoulders, he, he we started to see the Mitchell Trubisky that was the number two pick, right? Like, once, once the writing was on the wall, you knew he was out. It was like, okay, well... I, I'm going out there with nothing to lose. And you saw Mitchell Trubisky that was playing really well. Dude, I don't think you're going to get that 
this is crazy to say. I don't think you're going to get that level out of any of the quarterbacks this year. I think Justin Fields has the talent, but I pe- people are taking the bait on rookie quarterbacks. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I just think this is a team that has gotten worse rather than better. So I'm going to be taking the under on seven and a half. The thing is, they dropped half a game and you pick up an extra game to me. So if I'm betting on this team, this team could still go under 500, be 8-9 that overhit. Um, so if I'm just playing that game, I still think this team will be very, it's going to be competitive. You know, like the roster still holds it true enough to where they might be a fringe playoff team. Um, you know, I'm not a huge Justin Fields believer, but if he can put his talent together, maybe he like shines or some shit. I think, I think I'm going to hit the over just because I'm not saying that they're going to be a playoff team at seven and a half wins, dude. I'm just expecting this team to be eight round eight or nine. You know, I don't want to miss on that one. They give the extra game. Yeah. That's I listen. I think that there's value in the over here. Like, and at the end of the day, the reason I, I don't like taking the under is that this is a playoff caliber defense still, even though mm-hmm. I think their defense has gotten slightly worse. I mean, this front seven is still ridiculous and you still have very talented secondary players. So this defense could easily carry them if their offense isn't good. Um, but I, I just, I don't believe in the bears. Let's move on into our last team, the Minnesota Vikings. They burned me last year, but I'm sticking with the over. I still believe Mm -hmm. in this football team. They just got off to a really rough start at the beginning of last year. They were hot at the end of the year, from the middle of the year. Um, I think this is a Vikings team that is just, from from the top down, is built very well. I I really like their draft strategy. Hey, we're going to trade down, get more picks, and just pick a bunch of talented athletic players. I think that we're going to really start to see that depth pay dividends this season where you saw it start to come out at the end of last year. You had a bunch of young players step up. Now if we can get the offensive line playing a little bit better, get the defense on a better level, I think that especially at the end of the season next year, as long as they don't get off to that terrible start, because we saw that strategy, that depth strategy pan out at the end of the year. You know, when everyone's Mm -hmm. getting hurt and even they're getting hurt, like, you're still able to play at a pretty damn good level. Obviously not as consistent as you'd want it to be. It's not like they were smoking everyone, but they were a much better football team. I think that as long as we don't see the Vikings get shoot themselves in the foot by going like what, where they were like one in five started, to start the season yeah, or something. Yeah, they start. Yeah, they started. Well, was it zero and five or yet yeah, they were one in five? Yeah, they were something terrible like that. to yeah. start the season last it year, was and horrible. they finally put well, they it together. Stop, they, they couldn't stop a nosebleed. I, it was just it was crazy to see. Whoa! They couldn't they couldn't move the ball either. It was just everything going wrong. Um, yeah, I think that but, now, like we saw the emergence of Justin Jefferson at this at, at last year. You still have Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen. Like I think that this is a team that's that's just a, a year really helped them out, and and especially in non COVID year, I think we're really going to see him be back to the Vikings that we usually see on top of the fact that it feels like the Vikings are an every other year kind of team. It's like, okay, yeah. playoff team, miss it. Playoff team, miss it. They missed it last year. Now we're going to get back to the playoffs. Uh, I'm on the same boat as you. Uh, we all know that defense last year was very young and maybe they made more strides for the end of the season. They added more talent on top of that. A guy, especially a linebacker, we both like Chaz Durant. I think he could come in and make an impact day one. Uh, you've got Derek to help out that O-line that really struggled for Kirk Cousins last year. And I, I, and I just don't see Zimmer having that bad of a defense again. I, I still love this Vikings team. I'm easily hitting the over, and they're going to be my favorites to win this division. Man, it's just – I think that their GM might have listened to the podcast because they just took all the guys that I like. Patrick Jones was a dude that I loved at the Senior Bowl. They picked him up. Yeah. Obviously, they picked up Kellen Mond. Darisaw, I'm pretty sure he was my second best mm-hmm. offensive lineman in the draft. Chaz Surratt we both really loved. Cameron Bynum in the fourth as a safety, I thought was a nice little pickup there. Um, Dude, I I thought they had a fantastic draft. They picked up Blake Prohl. Blake Prohl, my guy. 
Um, <laughs> dude, I, I just think that this team has just got depth at every single position. Um, yeah, which easily. can't be understated. Like, there really is not a position I think that they're incredibly weak at. Maybe corner, but they, they added Patrick Peterson. So I, I think that they have that number one corner spot locked down again ever since they got rid of Xavier Rhodes. Xavier Rhodes. Um, yeah. Uh, whatever happened to Mike Hughes? Is he, like, They dead? traded him to um. They traded him to the Chiefs. Oh, nice little pickup for the Chiefs. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was a nice little pickup for the Chiefs. So, yeah, you got a lot of young players in this team that should take a step forward. I, I like what I'm seeing out of the Vikings this year, especially if Aaron Rodgers is not in Green Bay. He and, won't be. Oh, by the way, if, if I'm not sure I said it, but the Vikings over-under is nine wins. It didn't change from last year. Uh, yeah, we I both like hit that. the over on them, and we both missed. We're both on the over again. So, come on, Zimmer. Show, show us the money. Show us what you got. <laughs> Um, also, their defensive coordinator is Adam Zimmer. Well, co-defensive coordinator, which I think is kind of funny. Um, but now we have the Packers. What is going on in Green Bay? What the hell is this? Um, apparently, Aaron Rodgers is firing major shots. Every single time I see Aaron Rodgers in the news, he's like in Hawaii, and then he's I saw he was wearing the T-shirt, or what did it say? It was like, free me or something? I forget I, exactly yeah, what it was. Forgot. It was pretty petty. I, honestly, I like it from Aaron Rodgers, because I think that me and you are both on Aaron Rodgers' side, which is surprising to hear from you. But, like, I, I think that he's rightfully angry. I see a lot of people on Twitter being like, oh, well, the Packers, they, they surround him with good talent and blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah, the, the Packers have a good team. But I don't think that's the argument. So how I said it to Steed is how I'm going to say it here. The problem with the Packers isn't a specific draft pick. It isn't a specific free agent signing. It isn't the coaching staff. The problem with the Packers is their philosophy and how they attack off seasons and how they attack Mm. this team. Just look at, let's just take a look at all of the other good playoff teams from last year. The Bills. The Bills. Just, you know, they traded for Stefan Diggs. They actively yes. built an insane offense around Josh Allen, picking up, you know, getting guys like Brian Dable at OC and and making moves, like being active, right? Just being active, trying to really pushing to to get this roster in a spot to hey, we're we're competing. I mean, they they've been a good team now. The Browns. I mean, the Browns are a team, they take risks, whether it's under the current GM or not. Like, they went out and they picked up Kareem Hunt when everyone else didn't want to touch him. We we all knew he was talented. You know what? Dude, the Browns said, screw it. We're the freaking Browns. Like, let's. he's a talented player. Let's go get him. Who cares if we yeah, need right. him or not? Who cares what the PR says? We want to win games. And you saw the Browns being aggressive in offseason. They pick up John Johnson in free agency this year. They made him one of the highest paid safeties in the league. Right, you know they're they're attacking their roster. They pick up Clowney as well. Like they're really filling this roster out to be a contender. I mean, the Buccaneers. Do we even have to? I mean, they made all the moves in the world last year, and they've kept every player. They've kept mm-hmm. every player. They're they're foregoing the future to say we are going we to win, win now. now. We have the guy. We are winning now. Who cares about three years down the line? Every team has done – look at the Saints, too. The Saints were completely screwed this offseason because they said, we had Drew Brees, we are pushing all of our chips into the center of the table. Yeah, it sucks that they really choke in all the, every time they hit the playoffs, but, you know. The Rams. Dude, look at the Rams every offseason going out and acquiring players. The Seahawks, the Cardinals, all these teams are active. They, they understand what the situation is around them, right? They have the quarterback. They have the talent. Let's just go get that extra bit of talent that puts us over the edge, right? And the Packers have failed to do that year after year after year after year. They are not willing to mortgage their future to win games under Aaron Rodgers, they are just as worried with life after Rodgers 
as winning games with Rodgers now. And I honestly believe that that has been the difference in a lot of these NFC Championship games. It's top-down. Everything in this league is top-down. If if the top is not willing to just put put this team over the edge, get right through the finish line, well, the team on the field's not going to do that. And we've seen that two years in a row. They they got there, but they weren't able to just finish the job and, and, and punch in that last game to the Super Bowl and win it. Mm-hmm. And we're going to keep seeing that until we get a change up top. And the fact that they that if, if that's all it's going to take to keep Aaron Rodgers, just fire the the top the guys GM. in the organization, the GM, who, who cares? You do not have the Aaron Rodgers of GMs. Get him out of there. It is quite frankly ridiculous. What's your opinion on it, Steve? No, I agree with you. I think it comes to a point where I see Aaron Rodgers – side of side here because you know he knows he doesn't have much time in this league and he's given every ounce in this for this franchise i mean he sat behind brett Favre for a couple of years finally got his time won them a super bowl won them mvps taking them to numerous times of to the nfc championship i think he just looks at it he's like hey man i've given you so much why can't you give me a little bit back in return like i need a little more and for some reason, the GM. Uh, let's just look at the history of the Packers. When have the Packers ever been very active? Like made that big move in the free agency? It, they don't do that. That is like against their code. You know. They, See, I don't. I don't even disagree with it that much because my team, the Steelers, aren't necessarily like that. But in in the past couple of years, the NFL is different. If you want to win games, you have to be more aggressive, right? That's just the way that the game has changed teams are more willing to go all in on a quarterback's rookie contract. And it, and my team, the Steelers, dude, we've seen Kevin Colbert start to be a little more aggressive than usual. He traded up for Devin Bush. We need, we desperately needed a middle of We trade up for Devin Bush, right? Mm-hmm. Making a couple more moves, you know, getting guy. you don't have to just splash crazy amounts of cash and free agency. I, I don't think that that's the way that you necessarily win. But the Packers just neglect free agency in and of itself. They barely even make great value moves. It's like free agency is, uh, well, we're just not doing that at all. We're just going to only go through the draft. So it's like the complete neglect of these avenues and the fact that they don't even try is what is so aggravating. And if I'm Aaron Rodgers, dude, I don't give a fuck who's on the team. Aaron Rodgers is the team. He is the team. You're not winning mm-hmm. football games without him. So I don't care who you have, Devontae Adams, running back McGee, who cares? He's the guy. Either put the pieces together to have him get over the edge or trade him somewhere that's going to do it. Because there, every other team in the NFL, there are basically like what? 25 other teams knock out the other teams that have like the top six quarterbacks in the league outside of Aaron Rodgers. Like every single one of those teams will gladly say, Hey, Aaron Rodgers, come here, bro. Come here. We will trade every freaking pick within the next five years to build a super team to win two or three Super Bowls. I mean, that that's just the thing for me. I, I don't see Rodgers playing for, you know, five years later. I don't see Rodgers still in the league, right? Like he's not going to be like a Brady, I don't think. So, and if I'm the Packers and I have the MVP and I'm looking there, like, let's break the rules. Let's break what, what we've done in the past. And we have, we're tired of seeing us losing just by a little bit of the NFC championship. We need something to put us over that edge. I mean, yeah, maybe it's not like you don't have to do a big move. But, like, I think about, it like, when the Bears traded the Quill Mag. I know they didn't make it very far in the playoffs. But, I mean, that's a – it's a move that puts you over top a little bit. Maybe trade for a receiver. And like, like even the Bucks last year, they took a shot on AB and that worked out. I mean, maybe do something kind of move like that. Because like, listen, like AB is not the AB of the Steelers, but he's still pretty damn good receiver, and you can get him for mad cheap too. I, I like, I just think they're like waste. Well, they're definitely times already wasted because I think 
Rodgers has put up with it, and the GM is pretty much a stickler saying that he's not he's not giving in. See, I, like, I don't think that wasting is the right, right word. I think they, they got a little bit complacent. I think that they just said, hey, we, we're just – where we have the process. We're going to chill. And especially after seeing what the Bucks were able to do with Brady mm. and seeing that – Dude, you just like we mentioned, all the good teams that made it to the championship games were all the teams that went all in. It wasn't the teams that just sat around and said, "Oh well, we're gonna we'll get them next year. We have our our entire draft class. We're gonna spend a first round pick on a on on a D lineman, and then our second round pick on a corner. And okay, then then we'll draft a receiver. It's like, dude, no, no, no. These teams are active. They're saying. Dude, if, if we can get a Stefan Diggs, let's go trade the first. Let, let, let's just – chips in the table. Hey, with our first-round pick, instead of getting a guy that we can develop over the course of the next four years, let's get a dude that can play right now. Let's get a guy yeah. that we know can fill a major hole. Like, I, I feel like the pack we haven't gotten that out of the Packers. So, I don't think it's been one move. I think it's the overall philosophy. And especially think- after seeing it work with Tom Brady, it's got to be grinding Aaron Rodgers' gears. I think it is obviously because, like, he probably looks at Brady, and especially that's the team they lost to, really dishing in and going all in. Also, like, just look at their last two seasons, right? 13-3 and in both regular seasons, great. The first one where they got crushed by the 49ers, I don't think you can really be upset there. But, like, if I was a Packers fan, you knew this season was a little different, like, through the regular season. Like, you, some teams you were just destroying, like the Titans – uh, game on Sunday night. I mean, you blew them out. What was yeah. the score? Like 45, 14. That that's, that's a, I, and that's late season too, where you're really getting going to make this playoff push. Yeah. But that let me ask me, you this, Steed. Which, which rosters are you taking? I'll, I'll give you the three options or four options, right? Both the Packers teams from the, the most recent season and two years ago, and then the Bucks roster, last year, and then the 49ers roster two years ago. Rank them. We all know who the bottom two are. I mean, I would probably go... In Ooh. terms of rosters, excluding quarterback, it's that Niners roster number one because they yeah, were freaking Niners ridiculous. roster would be one. And then the Bucks aren't far behind. If you start including quarterbacks, it's probably the Bucks. I mean, I think it's mm-hmm. close. But we all know that the, the Packers' two teams, they're three and four. They're three and I four. I mean, look at... Look at the rosters and the, the the four teams in the championship series. Like, look at those. Uh, where are the Packers ranking those rosters? You know. So, and, and especially and like, like going back to Brady, it's like, is that not the reason that he left New England? That he wanted a team to just start se- like, dude, it's my final years. Let's start selling out, and, and the Patriots didn't mm-hmm. want to do that. Well, you see what happens when he goes to a team that did sell out. I mean, they had a good roster as well, but I, I think that like. Dude, the Packers have the roster. Just make it those three moves, right, that will really put you over the edge. All right. you have oh, anything no. else to say on this? I mean, that being said, the Rodgers can come back tomorrow and start training again with the team, and that and they'd easily win 11, 12 games and win that division, you know, and then they'd yeah. be back into it. But it, but that's the thing. Rodgers knows that, but he knows the outcome of it because he – nothing – I can get you only so far. You know, you got to give me a little couple other pieces. Also, one more thing. Interesting. I'm pretty sure tomorrow is the deadline where players can, like, opt out of the season, like, around, like, 4 o'clock. I wonder what – do you think Rodgers going to opt out? No, I don't think he'll opt out. I don't know. So, do you, do you think he's gone? You think he's going to get traded? Because like the GM's pretty hard headed about it, where he's saying he's bluffing, like it's not going to happen. Yeah, it's a weird organization because they have. I like, always used to think that Rogers didn't like Lafleur, and like when all this stuff came out, that was not it at all. Rogers l- likes Lafleur. That's the thing. Yeah, he hates that. He hates the front office. Uh, dude, I. See, the thing is, I think that this would have been really resolved if the Packers had a legitimate ownership, like a majority ownership, instead of having that public crap. Like, mm. dude, if they mm. had one dude at the head that had the final say in these decisions and, it's like, and and is not scared, dude, like, this thing I think would have been resolved already. I mean, we well, saw yeah. it with the Steelers. Like, dude, you had a, Ben Roethlisberger has a problem with Todd Haley. Who wins that matchup? The quarterback. 
Todd Haley's not the Ben Roethlisberger of offensive coordinators. Their GM is not the Aaron Rodgers of GMs. We all know who should go. It's not. It's not a difficult decision for me, and that decision would have been made months that and months true. ago. Um, that is true. Let's move on. Next segment. Let's talk about Zach Ertz because I saw a rumor on Twitter. Zach Ertz to the Bills. I feel like this is one of those moves that we kind of all knew was coming. It's just kind of a matter of time. It's a, it's a puzzle mm-hmm. piece fit for both teams. The Eagles need to move on from Zach Ertz. They need to dump his contract. And then the Bills desperately need that tight end that can really put him over the edge, right? The Bills are like the one team that is a competitive team without a solid, solid tight end. Um and that Not tight like end, like, one. like we saw in the playoffs last year when the Bills' offense started to get a little stagnant, they could damn well have used a, a tight end of Zach Ertz if you get a Zach Ertz at that level he was playing at a couple years ago. Um, I don't really have any thought. Like, just get it done. Just why hasn't it happened yet? Uh, you, someone's you stolen this. it. I think the Eagles are being a little shticklers about the price tag behind it. Like, dude, if you're going to trade the I'm guy, just fucking trade him. Like, yeah. he's what gone. What do you think the Bills give up for him? Like a six? Yeah. Right, how many years does he have left on his contract? I think it would be a great – well, of course it would be a great fit for the Bills and just give, you know, really Allen a second option on top of that. Because Dawson Knox is, a you know, a good tight end. Like, I like Dawson Knox, but he's not Zach Ertz, you know. The, the thing is, though, that's crazy about Dawson Knox last year – if you took him to score the first touchdown in pretty much every Bills game, you'd probably be up 100 units. That dude scored <laughs> every first touchdown in a game. It was crazy. Yeah, I think Dawson Knox is a good player. It's just you can't rely on him to be a, an elite-level tight end. We just haven't seen it. And that's mm. one thing to me that was clearly apparent, is that if you're a good team in the NFL, you have a good tight end. You can't name a team that was good aside from the Bills that didn't have a good tight end. Maybe the Steelers with Ebron, but the Steelers faded off at the end of the season. Like, if you, if you look at the teams that faded off at the end of the year last year, all of them didn't have a good tight end. And you look yeah, at the teams that got true. hot, like, they all had good tight ends. Ravens were hot. They had good tight end play. I mean, the Titans, like, John U. Smith is a – I, the NFL rated him pretty yeah. high. You got a massive contract. Yeah, you got paid. The Browns have <laughs> so three tight ends. Yeah, they do. Bucks Gronk was prime Gronk basically at the end of last year and, and in the playoffs. Also, I think Zach Ertz would just be good for like, of course, he'd be great on the field, but off the field and especially in the locker room because he does bring the winning culture. You know, he has experience. He's won a Super Bowl. He knows what it takes to win, especially in these deep playoff runs for, you know, a younger team, especially a young quarterback like Josh Allen that, you know, this team is on the cusp of being a true, like, a Super Bowl winner. I think he definitely brings that energy to Buffalo, and I think that goes a long way right there, just a veteran leadership. Yeah, I I just think if you look at the the Bills roster, tight end is one of the places you massively need an upgrade and not necessarily like you need the best tight end in the world like it's just a puzzle piece fit you need a guy like a Zach Ertz because if you get prime Zach Ertz it's all worth it and you really don't have mm. to give up at least I'm thinking major draft capital to get it done um, if, if Zach Ertz really had a market he probably would have been dealt during the draft so I really think that the yeah. market's dry for Ertz you can get him at a price that makes sense you have the cap room because Josh Allen's still in that rookie deal Just make it happen. Let's move on into the top 10 offensive lines. So we've been kind of doing this top 10 series every week, going through different positions. We've gotten most of the offense down, but we can't forget the big guys up front. Um, The guys that make it happen. I don't know how you want to do this. Um, I'm not sure if you had – did you have like an actual top 10 list? Because for me – I kind of had eight offensive line groups that I had as like, okay, these offensive line groups are legit. Tier one. Yeah, like tier one level. Okay, if I had to pick, these are the eight that I'm choosing from. So I can kind of just go through that, and then you can kind of say where you agree, disagree, and then pick two to add on. How about that? Yeah, yeah, I'm down for that. All right, 
So numero uno, I think this one's pretty self-explanatory is the Cleveland Browns. They had the best yeah. offensive line last year. They kept everyone. It was a group that was just bullying people. They have studs left, right, and center. I thought that Jedrick Wills was the best tackle in the draft last year, and he did nothing but really, like, show it. I mean, if you look at the offensive line, like, he was the weak link, and weak link is, like, mm. a weird term to use because he had a very good season last year for he a rookie. He's damn good, good. especially um, in pass pro. Yeah, that, that offensive line is just stud. I think if I'm choosing one, they're the easy choice. Um, now we kind of get into no particular order, but Indianapolis Colts are definitely probably the close second led by Quentin Nelson, the beast himself. Um, Best in the league. yeah, so they lost Costanzo, right? Yeah. He retired, but now, yeah, they pick up Eric Fisher. Um, they have a couple of other nice pieces up front, Braden Smith, um, Ryan Kelly, I think, is a is a pretty damn good center. Um, mm. Other than that, I think you kind of have a little bit of weak spots, but because you have Quentin Nelson, Ryan Kelly, just kind of as that tag team, it's like, dude, they will carry you, and Braden Smith is a pretty damn good player. Other one that I like, New England Patriots. I think this is probably one of the more underrated line groups in the league. Um, they lost... Um, they lost Tooney. They lost Joe Tooney, which really stinks. But if there's one thing that's been clearly apparent is that, dude, the the Patriots are able to replace guards like it's their job. Like, they're able to just yeah, find guards, replace guards, have great interior line play with those classic Patriot double teams. So I think we won't see them take a huge drop off on top of I the mean, fact that they, they picked get, up Trent Brown. Yeah, and Trent Brown's going to easily replace him. He's just coming back to New England, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so they have great players, Andrew, Shaq, Mason, uh, own Wenwu, the rookie last year who had a very, very, Isaiah good, Wynn. yeah, Isaiah Wynn, um, who we always kind of knew was good. He just wasn't able to stay on the field. So the Patriots, I think are a very, very underrated line group. It's an underrated Saints, squad. I think are definitely in there. Saints are there every year. Ryan Ramchek, Teron Armstead, just two solid ass players. Saints always have a solid line. And on top of that, um, Sean Payton's going to put that group in a position to succeed week in and week out. So that little combination kind of gives the Saints always an advantage. Um, other offensive lines that I personally like, I think the Chiefs offensive line is going to be very, very good next year. They obviously they traded for Orlando Brown. They went basically good. all offensive line in the draft. They signed, mm -hmm. they're the ones that signed Tooney, right? Yeah, they signed Tooney. Yeah. Yeah, like, um, also they get that that doctor, the, the offensive line doctor back because he opted out. What was his name? Like Duvernay something or another? It starts with a T. I, don't know, I forget his name. He's got a weird name. But they get him back from opting out, which will be big. Yeah, oh, sorry. Lauren Duvernay, Tardif. Yeah, him. So they get him back. This is going to be an offensive line that should be pretty elite next year, a lot better than the one we saw in the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Um, 49ers, I think, are definitely in my top eight. Dude, like, their offensive line was really solid last year. They have Trent Williams and Mike McGlinky, arguably the best tackle tandem in the league. And then they add Alex Mack, a guy that we saw have a great season for the, um, for the Falcons in their Super Bowl run at center. I think that we should be able to see him get back to that more elite level than we saw for the Falcons the past couple of years. So, and he's back with Shanny too, where he was, of course, he, like he was younger then, but where he was really dominant with, he was with Kyle Shanahan. Yeah, it just he fits that system apparently. Like he's just very good. We got we saw unbelievably good production with Shanahan. Um, next one in my list, I forget where I'm at, but the Bills are definitely in there. The Bills I have is easily one of the best pass pro offensive lines in the league. Whenever I watch the Bills game back on tape. Josh Allen had years to throw the ball, it seemed like. I think that the Bills <laughs> definitely should be in the conversation for being one of the better offensive lines. I think the only problem is that their run game just isn't great, and it hasn't been, yeah. whether that's on the offensive line or on the running backs. I don't really know. I need to do a film study on that. I haven't watched enough All-22. But in terms of pass pro and what they're asked their offensive line to do in Buffalo, I think that they're a top eight group easily for me. Um, 
Okay, so let me go over it. I had Browns, Colts, Patriots. I think it's six. Saints. Same. Chiefs. Chiefs. Bills. Bills, Niners. Seven, so you're at eight now. Who was my last team? I was. I think it was Tampa Bay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Tampa Bay. They took the other guy that I really liked last year, and Tristan Wirfs. I mean, last year was just a fantastic tackle class. And um, Ali Marpet is an absolute animal up front. The dude is a mauler. Uh, I thought that there was an offensive line that like kind of shocked me a little bit with how well they played. I was a little bit scared coming in, coming into the season, but we saw in that playoff run in the second half of the season, you know, the Bucks were basically elite everywhere. They that was a team <laughs> without a weakness, and offensive oh, yeah. line was right up there with like, dude, you, you take offensive line groups last year, they're probably a top five group last year. I can't see why they wouldn't repeat that this year. Yeah, they just return everybody. And especially right, Tristan so, Wirfs was so good. For I guess the first part is, do you disagree with any of those eight selections? No, no, those would be my top eight in, like, no particular order. Um, to add to – to finish out the top ten, I think you easily have to put the Rams in there. You know, Andrew Whitwork is – you know, even though he's old, he's still playing at high level. I'm pretty sure, though, today he said this is probably going to be his last season. So, uh, dude, I thought last year was going to be his last season. So he's yeah, I was about to say. I mean, it, <laughs> he might play until he's fifty. Who knows? Uh, Rob Havenstein, he's pretty damn good. David Edwards, it's just a really good, and it, it's kind of like the same thing with like the 49ers and Shanahan. McVay does a good job with these guys and gets them moving. So I, I think they deserve to be in the top ten. And you know, since the Lions, we we've given them shit earlier. I'm gonna throw them in there. You know, I'm throwing them in. You got Ragnow, who's a very great young center in the league. You great run Panay. blocking center. Dude's a stud. Yeah. And then you picked up Panay Sewell in the draft, the, probably the best O lineman in the draft, easily for me. And yeah, it might be a little outlandish to say, like, a rookie makes this big. I, I just think he's, like, already pretty much suited where the lines are set right there. And then you got Taylor Decker. So uh, with just those three, uh, like, on the O line, I think pretty much, like, put some in the top half of the league easily and definitely in my top 10. I don't know. I was thinking about it a little bit because I, I, I thought the same way before the pod about, oh, I'm not sure Penny Sewell can make that year one impact. But, like, did you look at the tackles last year and the impact they made? I, I know mean, Penny Sewell is a little bit raw, but, like, where would Penny Sewell have gone compared to the tackles last year? I mean, there's a good argument he still goes number one out of all those guys. I think he definitely goes before um... – Anthony Thomas, right, from Georgia. I don't I know. Like, for me, like, Penny Sewell, Thomas, and Wills were all pretty close. I, I don't know. Like, the tackles, like, he, Penny Sewell and then those guys last two years ago were just so freaking insane. Holy crap. Um, so, yeah, I don't see why with the recent tackle success, how talented Penny Sewell is. I mean, dude, you saw the Lions draft, draft room video, right, when they drafted him. They were just like, holy crap, he fell to us. It's a miracle. Like, they yeah. were going crazy. I know every single draft room is hype, like, for their pick, because you're obviously excited when you pick. But, like, dude, they were like, whoa, let's go. Like, yes. I mean, you um, just got, like, the number one player in his position at six, you know. It well, just yeah, like, the number one player in the position that. coming into the draft at the very beginning of the process. Top three player in the draft. Yeah, probably. there were people saying that he was – in terms of pure prospects, even better than Trevor Lawrence, not taking positional um, value into account, just who's the best player. A lot of people would have said Penny Sewell day one. Then it kind of like, okay, well, Trevor Lawrence and then Kyle Pitts, you know, okay. I still think Kyle Pitts is probably the best player in the draft. But, but yeah, I, I agree. But I think that Penny Sewell is probably top three. I think he'd be three. Oh, yeah, me. no, he's, he, he's in my theory. Um, um, yeah, so especially you said, like, it's different because O-linemen could come in day one and make it – like, a lot of players can come in day one and make an impact. But, you know, look when Quentin Nelson played his rookie season. That first game he played in, it was like, pff, okay, he's best guard in the game, and he's played one game, yeah. you know. And look at Tristan Wurst. At Tristan Wurst, like, he was a big part of that Super Bowl team. That shocked and me look, how good he was early on. And look at Dredger Wills. Like I know we talked about him already, but I mean, 
remember the Browns t- uh, two seasons ago, the big problem was the O line. Like Baker can't it, it just pressure all the time, and left tackle is such a problem. You put Jedrick and Wills in there, you upgrade the O line, and then boom, 11 and 5 team. So that's why I'm going to keep the Lions at 10 because it's, it, I'm not saying that the Lions are going to be like a playoff team because of it because like they have a lot more glaring holes but it's a nice building stone that they're starting with the Lions you know start up front <laughs> I, that's always been my I, I mean I've said it plenty of times in the pod but if I was a GM and I needed to rebuild that's the first thing I'm doing offensive line and defensive line I'm only drafting those players the first couple of seasons and then I'll fill out the rest of the bull crap I'll, I'll throw in some honorable mentions here. I think the first one that everyone's probably going to be thinking is the Dallas Cowboys. Just because they were so banged up last year, they had both of their tackles, Leo Collins and um, uh, Tyron Smith. Yeah, big-ass dude, monster. Dude, funny mm-hmm. thing about Tyron Smith, I remember because he's been like so injured the past couple years. I remember they were going over on a Sunday Night Football broadcast. His arms are so big that they had to use a knee brace on his elbow. <laughs> just they has couldn't extra find an life. arm brace that fits so they had to use a knee brace on his elbow that's how massive he is that's pretty um, impressive so i think that you have to give them an honorable mention if they get back to like fully healthy back to playing like they were a couple years ago this could easily be like the top I mean, group in the nfl i mean you still have zach martin next to quentin nelson who's the next guard you want on your team probably zach yeah. martin right so um, other team I think should get a ball, uh, I kind of sp- spilled the beans there a little bit. An honorable mention is Baltimore. Did you put Baltimore mm-hmm. in there? I, I I would have them in my honorable mention too. I. It's just like every single year this team finds a way to be good up front. Even after – like I know everyone's going to point to the fact that they lost Orlando Brown. I mean, I was thinking the same thing after they lost um that guard a couple of years ago to the Raiders. I forget his name. Regardless, um, this is the one thing that Harbaugh can do really well is he puts together a great group up front, whether it's mm-hmm. drafting them, picking guys up in free agency, whatever. Like the Ravens will always have a good offensive line. It seems like I, I have rarely ever seen this football team have a bad group and a below average group up front. And usually it's in like the top 10. Um, they, they always do it. And I think one. why they're not uh, – real quick about the yeah, Ravens, yeah. why they weren't in my top ten is because you look at the two seasons ago, 2019, where, you know, during the regular season when they went 14-2 and and looked damn near impossible, they scored on every drive. And that was really hugely done by the uh, O-line. They took a little step back last year, but you also got to remember Ronnie Staley did get hurt. Yeah. And, I mean, he's he's their franchise left tackle – so I think that Baltimore still should be in that top conversation. Yeah, you Last get one him I want to mention Tennessee, I think no, Tennessee, Tennessee's got to go on. Yeah, like even without Taylor Lewan last year, they were still a very, very good group, and now they get him back, um, one of the better tackles in the league. So I think that Tennessee definitely should get an honorable mention. I think has that top ten potential. But other than that, um, they're just missing the Isaiah Wilson. Teams. I mean, Washington football team was good last year, but they lost some guys. The Eagles maybe be able to bounce back. The Eagles were just so trash, but you talk about another team that was just plagued with injuries. Fully healthy, we could see them, like the Cowboys, have that resurgence back in. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they get Brandon Brooks, Lane Johnson, Andre Dillard. like, And then now you add one of my favorite offensive linemen in the draft, um, Landon Dickerson at center to replace uh, – Jason Kelsey. Kelsey. Is Kelsey – did he retire? I think he retired, right? Yeah. Whether he did or didn't, I, I'm, I have no idea. I'm going to assume he retired. But if he didn't, I mean, all the better. Now you have another freaking good offensive lineman. Um, I think the Chargers are good on paper, but the Chargers are always good on paper. I'm not gonna really going to believe them. But their O-line on paper is a complete 180 that was coming in last season. Yeah, so other than that, I think everyone else is, like, kind of just not in that top group, not in that top tier, doesn't – not worthy of the honorable mention. Um, okay, so we can go into the next segment, depending on how long this runs. So will be our second to last or last segment. 
probably second to last. It is Steed, your segment for your guy Baker Mayfield. To pay mm. or not to pay? That is the question. Steed brought up to me earlier that he thinks that the Browns should pay Baker Mayfield this offseason so that they could save on when guys like Josh Allen and and um, Lamar Jackson get their extension. If you wait until next year when those guys get their extension, you're going to have to pay them that money. And that if you paid him this year, you could just lock him up. Baker would play confident, not having the contract worries look over his shoulder, and then everything would be all good. I kind of argue that they shouldn't. Steed, I'm going to let you go first. Other than kind of what I said, like, why do you think that the Browns should pay Baker this offseason? Because he's the guy. Okay. I, I'm a huge, this has been known, but I tr- like Baker might not have the talent or at the same level as a Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, but. The reason is why you just said, I think if you go ahead and lock him up, you give him that confidence and just say, hey, man, you're a guy, you get him on a cheaper deal, and then you can work the contracts out later, and you're just competing. Like, you get you get all that worrisome out of your head. You can sit down and be like, here's a contract. This is what we value at. We're going to go ahead and extend you, say you're our guy, and let's go win a Super Bowl. That's how quick I would cl- – keep it with him, and that I think that would be a huge confidence boost. And he doesn't have to go into uh, this whole next year playing for a contract. He can go into the whole next year just playing for a Super Bowl. I, don't, I disagree with you, man. I actually really heavily disagree with you for a couple of reasons. The first being that we've just seen some of these quarterback contracts really blow up in people's faces. Now, I don't think that will happen with Baker – mainly because they, they have the coaching staff, at least I think they do, the offensive line. I mean, we just went over the offensive line rankings. They're, they were easy number one for us. They have mm-hmm. great running attack. They have good receivers. Like, I don't think it'll happen. But you can never be too hasty trying to pay these dudes the big bucks. Um, I think that they should have Baker earn it. Let's see another year out of him. You know, we really – and it was only a half a season last year that we really saw out of Baker. I want to see Baker put it together for a full-on season from week one to – is there, there's 18 weeks now. Man, that's weird to say. To week yeah. 18. <laughs> um, I, I want to see it the whole year. I want to see this Browns team – they've always, you know, aside from that one year with Freddie Kitchens, they've been the underdog. And you and I both well know it's easy to play when when you're the team that everyone scoffs at. You're the team, ah, oh, well, it's They're just not the that Browns. Anymore. Yeah, you're not that anymore. Everyone's, oh, it's the Browns. They get a good-ass team. And they're, they're expected good. to win games again. <laughs> Every time the Browns have ever had expectations, they've crumbled. Let's see if that happens again. Let's see if it happens. And uh, lastly, I just really don't think you're going to save all that much money signing him – whether it's this year or next year, whatever. I really don't – I think it's a negligible difference. But I guess it really depends, too. Like, if Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson come out and win, like, an MVP or something, and that jumps up there – like, Josh Allen can make $40 million, then, you know, and then Baker, if – let's say the Browns do make it deep in the playoffs and he plays well, and maybe not MVP level, he's going to want somewhere around – because he's going to look and be like, well, I got drafted with him. I, I mean – because I get like people saying like it's like a Jared Goff kind of thing like but I I'm just buying stock into Baker I'm buying as much as I can I'm buying as much as I can with this franchise I do, I think you're gonna see him excel even more next year and especially year two under Stefanski you you, you said yourself he you didn't really get rolling until half, halfway through the season I imagine with a full season now with the understanding of that playbook he's only gonna get better. <laughs> Yeah, my, my argument, like, uh, you would save a little cash. So I'm, I'm going to come out here and say that next season, especially with the cap increasing with, with COVID, it might increase a whole lot. So it could be even larger than this. Yeah. I'm thinking somewhere between like $170 million to $180 million on a four-year deal. I'm looking at Dak's contract. He got four years, $160. Mm. Um, a lot of that guaranteed, too. Yeah. Um, Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm still waiting. I think I'm still waiting until next year. Let's see. I want to see it to believe it. 
Like, I, because I'm with you. I, I'm buying more of Baker than I'm selling, right? I think that Baker Easily. has the talent. We saw him put it together. He's confident. He's in the system that makes him work. We saw the Baker that he was drafted to be at the end of last year. Now he gets Odell, right? Like, everyone's coming back. Another year in the system, non-COVID year. We should see Baker explode. I want to see him explode before I give him $160 plus million though. Like, I'm not going to give I mean, him the contract fair. and then expect him to explode. I want to see him explode, then get the contract, not give him the contract and hope and pray he explodes and this doesn't blow up in my face. Because I, I thought I'm, that that the Eagles played the Carson Wentz contract really well, and even that blew yeah. up in their face. Whether that was because of Wentz or not, I think is a different debate in and of itself. I think that the Eagles were a whole lot to blame there as well. I think um, also if you compare him and Baker, I think their um, mental part of the game, like Baker has that way under more control than Carson Wentz. Yeah, so when I mean, Baker's get tough, just like that kind of – he's just kind of that dude. He doesn't – he's not really phased phase, very no. easily. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I disagree. I, I would wait to pay Baker. I'm giving him the keys to Ferrari, man. I'm like, drive me to the sunset. Him and Stefanski. <laughs> So fancy run shotgun. Here we go. All right. I like that, though. Um, let's move on to our last segment. <clears throat> it's like a who's on the hot seat kind of a thing. So I don't know how do you want to go by a position. Did you want to just start saying who's on the hot seat? We can just start going back and forth and listing guys who are on the hot seat if you want. Yeah, you just want to start like hot seat on like offense first or something like that. Yeah, well, I'll go first because if you listen to any of the this podcast or the Dynasty podcast, you'll know that I am not exactly a Bengals fan by any stretch of the imagination. And a large part of that stems from I do not think that Zach Taylor is a quality head coach. I've said it before. If I'm picking head coaches, he's damn well near the freaking bottom, um, mm. at least of guys that I've seen. Yeah, um, he's got to be down there. So now – I think that the if you do not succeed with the Bengals, because for as much crap as I give the Bengals, they at least have a roster now. Like they have a competitive roster on paper. Got if you go out here and have a five win year and get bullied by the AFC North teams again, how much more leeway does he really have to suck? You I know? think he would he would have to be gone, especially like how fast this league is now. I if a coach is not sitting in year two, I, I'm, I'm canon. You know, I, I'm trying to get something else. I mean, especially from the perspective that, dude, if you look at the Bengals, like we saw how with with the Jaguars, they were able to get Urban Meyer out of retirement, right? Urban Meyer was like, nah, I'm done. Regardless of, like, Urban Meyer wasn't just coming back to coach any team willy-nilly. Like, he knew exactly what he was yeah, – I feel like you have that similar – pull with Joe Burrow and the situation and the talent on the roster. Like, dude, especially if you're an offensive minded guy, like, well, holy crap. Like, look at all this talent I have. And I have a quarterback. I don't have to worry about finding the franchise quarterback. At least right now, it seems like you do. So Mm -hmm. it's like a pretty sexy destination. The only thing that sucks is that the AFC North is a damn tough. It's a gauntlet. Yeah, it's a gauntlet. It's a damn tough division to compete in. But I mean, regardless of that aspect, Dude, this is a Bengals team that should get a whole lot of, like, shine in terms of potential coaching options. And if you compare them to the other teams that have that have had availabilities recently and you can project to have an availability next year, the Bengals are probably the top dog. Unless mm-hmm. the team – maybe the Cowboys are above that. But the Cowboys are the Cowboys, though. Like, you're, you're the Bengals. You haven't won a playoff game in can, 30 years. It's not like you have – Cowboys, you're expected to win – Right now, like now. Bengals, at least you have a little bit of leeway. I can so, think of one top more destination if it didn't work out. It would be the other coach I think is on the hot seat is Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah, if, he, if he got fired, yeah, if he got fired, I think you know you're licking your chops to get Kyler Murray. Okay, yeah, so that's the next one on the hot seat. I guess we could do a lot of the coaches first. Is Cliff Kingsbury? I agree. Um, I actually thought it's funny because. Uh, the the Cardinals were a team that started off hot and then finished cold. A lot of that was because Kyler Murray got hurt. I actually thought that Cliff Kingsbury improved a little bit as the season went on, though, as a as a play caller, making adjustments from my um 
for my Cardinals analysis. I thought that him and Kyler finally started to get on the same page a little bit before he got hurt. Um, you started to see him get some really big results, and they just missed out on the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that Cliff Kingsbury is here to stay, actually, which is surprising to hear from me because I'm not the biggest Cliff Kingsbury guy, but I think that they have the pieces to that they're going to put it together here. I think they – I still think they're going to make the playoffs, and I said that in their over-under. I do like this team to make playoffs, but saying that, if they don't make the playoffs and they fall to, like, maybe an, another, like, 7-10 and 10 or a 6-11 and 11 season, they're underperforming, and you have a talent like Kyler Murray, he's got to go. He's got to go. And Kyler yeah. came out and said today in this article I read, he's like, I'm not – he's like, the one thing I don't want to get used to is not making the playoffs. So Kyler already has that mindset. And that tells me, you know, he, who who cares? If, he wants a coach that's going to give him the best ability to win. If Cliff Kingsbury's not that guy this year, then I would move on. Because, like, yeah. how many more years are you going to have with Kyler Murray until you got to pay him, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, these big bucks, you know, because, well, like, he's going to get a 40 plus too, mil. Is that I think that Cliff Kingsbury is a good coach. I think he's a good developmental coach, especially. It's just when you when you compare him to some of these other top coaches, especially in that division where that division you have, it's like an all-star lineup of coaching, right? Oh yeah. It, you have to go through so many McVay, Shanny. Just, and Pete Carroll. And Pete Carroll has been Pete doing Carroll. it for years and years and years and years. He's and years. the old man, but he, he still knows how to beat you. It doesn't matter. Um, Like, dude, that's tough. And that just means that you have to be that much better than an average coach to really succeed in a division where you got, an all-star lineup. So I think that that's almost my potential problem with King, Cliff Kingsbury more so than I don't he's think not he's the best great. Coach in that yeah, it's just division. if you have the worst coach in the division, you don't win. That's just kind of the way and, the news goes. And that's the card he's hand, handed, you know, like you're an NFL coach. like. But we said that about Zach Taylor too, like him being not the best. But these two coaches, they play in the two best divisions in their respected uh, conferences, you know. But, you know, they're young yeah, guys. Zach Taylor's in a certain, similar circumstance. Now you bring it up. Yeah. Just, I, I don't think Zach Taylor has the has the stuff. I think that Cliff Kingsbury has shown some of the stuff. He just needs to really I mean, like win. Dude, you're right. He's on the high. He needs to put it together this season. We need to see the, yeah. the Cardinals clicking. And it's like it, the Cardinals are just like mediocre through the season. It, it, that's one thing. But they cannot start 6-3 and three again and miss the playoffs. Yeah, if I, if a team starts 6-3, and three, you should be able to – like because what do you have to do after that point? You basically have to play 500 ball and you're in the playoffs. Like yeah. it's, it should be easy after that. Okay, last head coach – Actually, we have two, but we'll we'll speed run it a little bit so we can get onto some of the other players that are on the hot seat. So a twofer here, Vic Fangio and Mike McCarthy, and I think it's for a pretty similar reason in that these are smart coaches. These are good coaches, right? I don't yeah. think anyone's going to come out here and t- and say that Mike McCarthy and Vic Fangio don't know their stuff, that they haven't been very successful before pioneers of the game and have been and have had very successful stints not necessarily mike mccarthy is a head coach vic fangio is a coordinator right yeah but at, at some point it's like i feel like you just can't teach an old dog new tricks and that's they, how i feel you know you you pick the guys if you were to rank all the coaches on who has failed to adapt to the modern game it's these two guys. And it sucks mm-hmm. because I actually – I think that Mike McCarthy gets a lot more hate than he rightfully deserves. But the head coach spot in the NFL, if it's almost like the quarterback spot. You either are a kind of guy that can turn a bad roster into an average roster and you're like the guy, or you're a guy that you need the great roster to carry you to be an average team. That's I, what I feel I'm with getting these the guys. ladder from these guys. That that's the problem. I think it falls like there's the they're the same, but Vic Fangio is in a different little because like you know Vic Fangio is going to have a good defense regardless, yeah. and he just needs offense and he has weapons around him. He just doesn't have the quarterback. Mike McCarthy, you know, on paper he has the offense. I mean, he has a top ten quarterback. 
The defense is a little suspect. But you talk about someone who's not been able to adapt. I really never got the Mike McCarthy hire when it first happened. You know, like it was that, that didn't feel like Cowboys move. Cowboys usually hire within, but I guess they wanted to reach out. And I know when he got hired, a lot of people said Mike McCarthy is like take a look into like analytics now. He's a different kind of coach. I didn't really see that last year besides him doing something different, smashing 200 uh, watermelons last year. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm not expecting big, I, the only Vic Fangio, I would, I could expect that team to be playoff fringe, but like that's going to depend on their quarterback play. And unless they got Aaron Rodgers, I, I would think these two guys are gone. And Vic Fangio would easily get another job as a coordinator in the league, easily. My well, McCarthy, I think that Mike I McCarthy so. could too. See, really? that's, I don't that's the so. thing though, is that I think that these guys schematically, especially, are like very good coaches, right? Like, Dude, I mean, I mean obviously NFL it. coaches know their stuff, but like if you if you just put Mike McCarthy in charge of an offense, like offense, especially passing wise, is gonna be good. I mean, dude, you saw it with Andy Dalton. They had once they got it figured out at the end of the year, like they were a dangerous offense, right? And mm-hmm. dude, he had no offensive line to work with. He his entire offensive line got hurt. So it, yeah, that, he, that was a tough hand he was dealt last year. He was he was dealt a hard hand, and if I would like to see a Cowboys, especially on offense, them fully healthy to see what they reach. But also you have to look at the fact is when was the last time a running back sustained in a system? You see a guy, Zeke, who was coming in yeah. last season, easily top 10. And I don't even know what I was watching because, like, they play every Sunday well, he night. he was also fumbles it on. McGee out there. Zeke yeah. Dude, and Zeke doesn't fumble. Like, I, I – is that Zeke? Is that McCarthy? I don't really know. I, maybe it's the shelf life of running back, and they shouldn't have paid Zeke. But, like, going contract. back to Vic Fangio really quickly before we move on from the coaches, man, like, just fucking don't suck at the end game stuff. Yeah. Like, your time management cannot be that bad. Your end game scenarios cannot be that bad. Like, it is just hard to watch the Broncos games. And just the general inconsistencies from this football team. One week they look like they're insane. The next week it's like, what the hell is going on here? Really getting the vibes that Vic Fangio, there was a reason he was a coordinator for so long, which sucks because I really like Vic Fangio. I, Dude, like you said, you could give him the, the Texans defense last year and he'll turn him into good. an average group. It's mm-hmm. just... Can he put the whole team together and not suck in the end game scenarios and with time management and all that? Uh, because that's it, a big thing. It's a, yeah, time it's, it's underrated. For coaches is so huge because think about it. That's why Harbaugh has had this job for so long. It's why Vrabel is going to be the Titans head coach for so long. Because like you look at when the Titans have a lead and especially that playoffs game against the Patriots. I mean, they shaved two minutes off the clock and they didn't even run a play. It's just the little I, things. It, Even Belichick, like. If you want to create a competitive advantage, it's one of those aspects that you have to be good at, right? It's just the name of the game. It's, you are fighting for the smallest bits of an advantage. And this is one of the ones that if you've been around the game for this long, like it should it should be like the back of your hand. You shouldn't have to think about it, you know? Just play a game of Madden. Um, all right, let's move on. I think the quarterbacks are pretty self-explanatory, who's on the hot seat and who's not. Daniel Jones is the one that instantly jumps out. You need him to have this year three explosion. The the Giants, we both believe, are a playoff team that are just missing the quarterback. Are we going to get it? Yes or no? I don't think that one really needs to be expanded on. Mm -hmm. Other one, and you you brought this up, uh, I guess we can kind of go with both of the traded quarterbacks to a certain extent, Sam Darnold and Carson Wentz. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, this is the ultimate battle of, is it the situation or is it just the player? We're going to mm-hmm. find out this next season because they're both in very good spots where we really like the head coaches. Like, they have a lot of the – like, the situation's a huge upgrade in both scenarios. Like, there's no excuses left anymore if these guys go out and start sucking. 
Oh, no, n not at all, especially for Carson Wentz, too. You, you go from the Eagles O-line that was just distraught last year to, you know, from earlier in the show, we were saying the Colts have number two O-line league. So it's time to put the money on the table and for you to, like, step up and show, like, it was the Eagles' fault and not yours. Also, with Sam Darnold, I mean, you're going into one of the best – you're going into a place where, you know, doesn't get the media like New York – very under pressure, and you get a great coach at Mark Rule, and you get Joe Brady, who, you know, probably be a head coach here in the next season. Or yeah, two. he's had success with just about every single quarterback he's worked with in recent memory. Like, I mean, Teddy Bridgewater, you know, JT, if, if you're watching, A, screw you, B, like, the guy put up average quarterback numbers and there's a whole lot of people that would argue that Teddy Bridgewater is not an average quarterback and that he's I mean the NFL doesn't seem to value him like he is he got traded for what like a sixth round pick yeah. um so like yeah I agree that you know this, the excuses are up for these guys other quarterbacks are on the hot seat you mentioned to me Matt Ryan I would like you to explain that one to me so the reason why I would say Matt Ryan's on the hot seat, I think he's going to, you know, it's not where like his play or whatever, but I think the new coaching staff is looking into like if the Falcons do suck again and they get into that top five pick range. I like Matt Ryan's going to have to do some stuff to make them think like, okay, we could play with him another couple of seasons or we're just going to pick our franchise guy and just move on from him. So I think it really – he's on the hot seat because he needs a good season that propels and wins, not just a good season that, you know, it's just numbers, you know, mm -hmm. to really stick around. Yeah, and I think we can all agree that Matt Ryan's play did drop off to a certain extent last year. I mean, like, is it – it's still hovering – easily top 15 still. Is it that top 10 elite level? Probably not. I mean, you do lose who – and that's gonna, I don't think it'll hurt him too much because, I mean, Calvin is a monster, and then you add Kyle Pitts. I think it just comes on to it like, hey, Matt, like we've seen quarterbacks in the day like win games with, you know, not as talented rosters. We're going to need you to do the same thing to give us belief for another year where we can develop and put a roster around you. If not, if we're going to be picking again in this top five, then we're more likely just going to take a quarterback and move on. I mean, yeah, there was talks about him taking a quarterback this offseason, so I would not be surprised if, I, you know, the contract. There's just so many things that seem to be working against Matt Ryan. Like, are the are the Falcons going to be able to get in a spot where they're a contending team to warrant having this veteran quarterback, or are they going to want to rebuild? It's going to be also, interesting. Also, just the, the play of the quarterback is just so different because, like, now you think about it – the most lebel, least mobile quarterback, who's it got to be? I, like, I think it's Matt Ryan. <laughs> like, I think it's Matt. Like, I hate to say it, but, you know, yeah, it does the O-line suck and he takes a lot of sacks, but, I mean, some of that is just because, you know, he can't create plays on his own, and that's where the game is really generated to. So if you can't be a, a contender in this old age, I think they'll just move on to a more nowadays kind of quarterback. Yeah, I guess the last quarterback, I don't really want to go into these guys because these ones are the obvious ones. I mean, not that these other guys haven't been obvious, but Mac, not Mac Jones. His other guy, Cam Newton, Cam. is definitely on the hot seat, but that, no surprise there. And Jared Goff, right? Because we, we're kind of all expecting that the Lions might move on from him at some point. You know, they have all these draft picks. If, if they have the ability to take that new, shiny, number one quarterback or number two quarterback, who knows? Let's go into some of the other guys, though. I personally believe that Odell Beckham is on the hot seat. Just because, dude, the Browns gave up a lot in that trade for him. Obviously, it was a previous management, but, you know, Odell Beckham, It's uh, people still think he really has the talent, that he can – he just hasn't put it together, really, since he's left New York. Like, Are we finally going to see that from him? Yeah, he especially the amount he's being paid, you kind of do want him to play like he was early in New York. 
the thing is, last season, you saw him get back into that little relevant category where he was playing good, maybe not at an elite level, and then, of course, he got hurt. And that's one thing with Odell, too. He's got to learn how to stay healthy. I mean, he's gone down too many times, and I think that alone puts you on the hot seat as well. Like, hey, man, if you're going to be our true number one in this contending team, like, we proved we don't really need you to win, but you could definitely help out the squad if you get back into a nice form. I think that puts a lot of pressure on him himself. I actually do think we will see Odell Beckham back to what he was this season. Um, Cause you're right. Like people kind of discount his play on the field for the Browns. Last, like he was a good player for them. So I think that we should see him back. Other receiver on the hot seat is actually a guy I really liked coming out is that's Marquise Hollywood Brown. Yeah. You know, last year, like he was inconsistent. We did see him put it together at the, at the back end of last year. When, when that Ravens offense really started clicking on all cylinders like we kind of expected them to. I mean, we just saw the Ravens invest a whole lot of draft capital into their receivers. Like, dude, when, it's only a matter of time before the Ravens got to pick up this fifth-year fifth year option or not and all that. Like, I, I think there's a very realistic scenario where we see Hollywood Brown not in a Ravens jersey in the near future. I think so too. He need, he needs a breakout year this year. I know he he led the team in receiving last year, but that's not too hard. I think he only had like seven hundred yards or whatever. But I'm hoping now that they've invested a little more, where he doesn't have to be like that true number one guy on the outside, and maybe he could play more of his game. That he can have more of a breakout role. But if dude, if he just kind of falls into this little limbo where he's just kind of like there on the field again for me. I, I don't see the Ravens picking him up. Yeah, we can get into some of the other positions and players. I think a guy on the hot seat is Andre Dillard for the Eagles. Mm. Like you said with the injuries, like uh, eventually you got to play, right? You can't just get injured yeah. every year and say, oh, well, he's a good player, but he's got like, eventually you got to, get on the field and, and start getting some results and getting some snaps and some reps that are good here, out here. Another guy too is Zeke because I think that Zeke, Zeke is... like if you look at the fantasy football community, the dynasty fantasy football community, especially like a whole lot of people think that Zeke is washed. I personally think that dude, Zeke is his career. I, I said on the dynasty podcast that released, it would be two days ago, I believe. No, it'd be yes day from when this is released that his career trend has just gone way down like it's just been a constant downhill slope ever since his first year in the league basically uh, his first couple years it's just kind of been a consistent downtrend generally speaking when we see that that downtrend continues like there's only so far you can go down before you're not worth that contract and you're going to be a cap casualty at some point so he needs to yeah. have a big year this year. He can't be fumble rooski again. He needs to show up for this Cowboys team. Yeah, he really does because then you fall into that part like where like Todd Gurley, you know, he was at that elite level for so long, then boom, decline like during that Super Bowl year and he never the same player. I, I really don't know what to think of Zeke. I think he's definitely on the hot seat. Do I think he, he'll ever get back to like the – previous form he's at probably not and i don't know maybe that's why like you're hearing tony pollard more circling around the cowboys you know getting more pt but they they said that z is in good, good best health of his life coming into ota so yeah i've heard that story before um, uh, they said about Dwayne haskins last year yeah <laughs> so another running back that's on the hot seat almost in the exact opposite scenario is miles gaskin right because this is a dolphins football team that they've really tried to upgrade the running back position but they weren't able to sign Le'Veon during the season last year and then they got mm -hmm. jumped when they're trying to draft one of these running backs in the draft this year so miles gaskin seems to be the rb1 and i say it's the opposite situation from zeke because miles gaskin is going the other way like he's been trending up but how much further can he go and like, dude, he, I mean, he's on the hot seat for the other reason. It's like, dude, you have a huge opportunity here. Is he going to be able to take it? And do the Dolphins even trust him enough to to give him that out? It's an interesting scenario, what's going to happen for the running back group in Miami. And if before the season starts, I still think that they're going to look for someone to bring in if that happens Easily. or not. 
easily. I, I, they definitely wanted to upgrade, and like I guess the cars didn't fall for him. So Miles Gaskin has an opportunity here. You know, your RB one last year, you played pretty good. Now we want to see you take the next step and be that guy on this, uh, what we believe is a playoff contender. Um, so he's really going to have to show up. And if he falls into like what everybody's kind of leaning towards, he's not that guy. Then, you know, he just I can't I can't say he's not that guy and think of that. Yeah, meme, the but, meme. Uh, <laughs> but you know, he's in. I think like he's. I would love the position that Miles Gaskins in. You know, you got you got a chip on your shoulder. You're the number one guy. Just go out there and do it. You got a great O line. You got you got a good offense around you. You got good pieces. Go out there and just take it. Yeah, I liked Miles Gaskin coming out of Washington. Like he was a pretty damn good receiver. I did not expect him to be as good of a receiver that we saw last year. Right? Like, I th- I thought he. I don't know that he just really developed in that aspect of his game. Um, let's move on to some of the defensive players. Who do I want to pick? I'm going to go with someone that I think is like a consensus pick here. And that's Damon Arnett. I know he's a young player. Um, he was drafted last year, but I mean, I guess this goes out to basically every single Raiders defensive back. Like, this is a team that seems like they've been drafting D backs in the first and second round. Uh, just in the draft in general, like every year they've been hammering it. Like, dude, you guys have to show up sooner or later, or this coaching staff is getting canned. So oh, not only right. is like necessarily the the GM Mike Mayock and John Gruden to a certain extent on the hot seat, like these D backs are too. Like eventually y'all gotta start playing well and be worth these first round picks we're spending on you. Easily. Uh, I, I, the Raiders, what they've been doing in the draft and just taking all this secondary help, like you spent Damon Arnett, like, hey, man, like you got to step up and do your job. So I think another one is um, I'm going to go Jason Verrett. Because mm. Jason Verrett, he signed, I think, a two-year deal. He had a great season last year, right? Finally, we saw the talent that Jason Verrett had. He was finally able to stay healthy for the Niners. But now you got to be the number one guy. And now, you you know, pressure's back on. Expectations are back on. Are you going to be able to do it again? Are you going to be able to recreate again? Or are we going to see the classic Jason Brett season where he gets hurt and then, you know, the shenanigans starts happening? So I think that he's kind of on the hot seat here in terms of, like, are you the number one corner or are you not, right? I The thing is, I'll say for Jason Brett, is that he already has kind of, like, experience in that number one corner because Richard Sherman went down or whatever. So he's had to fill that role. Yeah, but now you got to do it the whole year though. Yeah. It it has to be consistently now, like 17 games. Now you're the guy you're going to be paired up. I mean, against DK against all these big, big guys, big name guys, like you got to go out there and show out. I think, yeah, it's a big year for him, especially with this defense, not as talented as you're like, it's still really good, like front seven and the, good defense, but it's not as stacked as it was, especially two years ago. They're really going to need him to step up, and he deserves to be on the hot seat. Yeah, I guess the last one we're, we're doing all the D-backs is Kevin King. I mean, we all remember King, him from the uh, the NFC Championship. He sucks. But, yeah, I mean, he's still on the team. Like, he's going to have to have a good year here to, to keep I his don't, spot. I they, they, they resigned him that one year deal. Like he's definitely on the hot seat. But the thing is, I don't think he's even gonna play much. I, mm. They draft. You have Jair Alexander, and you drafted Eric Stokes. You know, like you kind of just. I think they just kind of like resigned Kevin King because he was cheap, and you know he's still like talented, and he's like a good athlete. Maybe if you find him in this less role, he'll succeed, and then you get a decent corner for cheap. But, you know, if he can't even do that role, I mean, I don't even know a team that would take a shot on him after this. All right, we're 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 starting to run low on time here. So I'm going to go with another one, D. Ford. I think D. Mm. Ford is clearly – well, D. Ford and Frank Clark, right? Um, I think both of these guys are on the hot seat. Frank Clark, kind of for different reasons. Right? D. Ford just he has that back injury, um, not really seeming to be worth the contract that he was given after that Super Bowl year where he was a beast. And now Frank Clark, it's like, 
you just really haven't gotten the production out of him, especially last year. That, that, that pass rush for the Chiefs was pretty dog shit. They were like one of the worst pass rushing teams in the NFL, but they were still able to have a good defense on the back of their secondary. So like it's kind of put up or shut up time for both mm-hmm. of these guys. Yeah. And uh, another D lineman for me is Dante Fowler. You know, uh, Dante Fowler signed that huge contract after having success playing with the Rams, and he did not play well for the Falcons at all. I think he had maybe like, what, two sacks last year? Crazy numbers. I, You know, you got to prove to me, because like you're going to be the number one pass rusher, and you're like alongside Grady Jarrett. If you got to prove to me that it just wasn't Aaron Donald and that you are that top five talent that you were taking in whenever he was drafted too, like you got to earn your contract or if not, the Falcons will easily move on from you. It's funny. The Falcons, I feel like for since the dawn of time have been looking to find a guy to play alongside of Grady Jarrett for like the past oh, we 10 years. Had, it seems like, yeah, we haven't had like a very great pass rusher. That's consistently good since uh, Abraham, Jonathan Abraham. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just, like it, it's, it's not actually as long as it, as it seems like, but I don't know. It just feels like, man, can we just find that edge rusher, please? Like a guy that we just know is that yeah, dude like Grady on the Jared edge. is so good, but he can only do so much. Like I, you would hope Dante Fowler, like I know Grady Jarrett's not Aaron Donald, but would have like some one-on-one looks and have success in those looks, you know, yeah. at least bring some pressure. He just was non-existent last year. Plus he was hurt. You got to stay healthy. All right. So, I think with that being said, that's going to do it for the episode. Uh, If you made it this far, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. If you haven't, hit that like button, hit that follow button. You have any questions, comments, whatever, leave us a comment in the comments down below. But thank you so much for tuning in, and peace out.